are continuing in First Peter, and I am trying to be honest and teach all, and not do like the commentaries do, skip the hard places. Uh, this that I say is a hard passage of scripture. Peter might very well have had himself in mind when he said that Paul was in things very hard to be understood in which the unstable and the unlearned were rested at them. Paul said, Peter said that about Paul, but he might have said it about himself, because he did give us something very difficult here. Verse 18 of chapter 3, For Christ also hath once suffered for sin, the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit, so he went and preached under the spirits in prison, which sometimes were disobedient when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark of God was a prepared. Wherein few, that is, eight souls were saved by water. To give her and to even baptism doth also now save us. Not the putting away of the children's place, but the answer of the good conscience by the resurrection of Jesus Christ who is gone into heaven and is in the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers subject unto him. Verse 6 of chapter 4, For for this cause was the gospel preached also to them that are dead, that they might be judged according to men in the place, but live according to God in the Spirit. Now verse 21 tells us about uh, baptism being a figure and a good conscience toward God and the resurrection of Christ, verse 20, Christ sent him, and his high place of authority over angels and powers, we mention inasmuch as we have dealt with it quite poorly. So I am to speak about Christ, spirits in prison, over six, then we are dead. And I will say that there is more in this this morning for the curious, and there is for the but I am still not going to pass it up for a number of reasons. One is that the passage is here by creation, and if it had not been intended that we should expound it or, it, or attempt to understand it, it would not have been put here. There are options in the scripture. But even though the few passages were divinely inspired, and for that reason need to be treated with respect, even if we are not able fully to understand it. The second reason that I'm going to courageously attempt an exposition here is that I want our people to be fully. We cannot be informed fully if we skip the hard place and all made scriptures that can be understood. And third, and I think this is the more important, most important of the three, teachers specialize on difficult texts. Heresy always thrives in obscurity, or on obscure passages, and dies when the full light of God reaches it. Let us take such a passage as 1 Corinthians, where it talks about the, the baptizing for the dead. Now it tells us that, uh, else, verse 29, else what shall they do which are baptized for the dead? Dead rise not at all. Why are they then baptized for the dead? Now Paul put that there, and exactly what is meant by it. And certainly he did not approve it. He only used it casually point for a future life. But there are those who practice baptism for the dead. And if you get to ritual, they quote you that obscure and difficult passage from 1 Corinthians 15. Say, why would you object when there were those in Corinth that baptized for the dead? So they make a whole rest upon one verse. Let me give you a good working rule for the understanding of Scripture. 
seven more than one verse to support it don't teach it. Because if it isn't found in one verse of the Bible, the chances are it isn't found there either. And that what you think is the passion of certain things does not teach it at all. Now, suppose that I were going to argue uh, for the future life, and I were writing to people who practice masses for the dead. And I, how can you deny the future life when you practice saying mass for the dead? I would say to them, in effect, now you yourself admit the future life because you are acting as though those persons who had died were still in existence. Therefore, you yourself believe in a future life. The very practice of saying masses proves it. But that wouldn't mean that I approved saying masses for the dead, so that I was arguing that they believed in a future life by the fact that they attempted to help people in the future. Paul meant here. Paul did not in any wise practice Baptism for the dead, nor did he exhort anybody to do There's one line in the Bible that teaches it. But he appeals to something they already, some of them at least, did, and to show how inconsistent they were in saying that there was no resurrection. And it's obvious that the said there were no resurre- was no resurrection were the same one who practiced baptism for the dead. And then take that famous one to use the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Now that's obviously an obscure passage. I have never heard it uh, satisfactorily explained. We'll give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatever you open will stay open. Whatever you close will be closed. Now, isn't it clear a Roman Catholic friend will deny that the Bible has any authority over the church on the ground? The Bible came out of the church and not the church out of the Bible. And they will deny whole scripture because they say, well, you don't understand it, and besides that, it isn't binding upon us because the Bible is the daughter and not the church, the daughter of the Bible. Therefore, the Bible has no authority over the church. But if you complain that the Pope Christ bites dear and on earth, they will run to that obscure passage, I will give unto you the keys of the kingdom, and they say, how dare you deny it. Well, the Bible says, I will give unto you the keys of the kingdom, and that was Peter, and this Pope is the descendant of Peter. I don't know how we get that way, but uh, Paul's teaching always runs an obscure passage. An obscure passage. Which reminds me of the Mormon missionary that was traveling, and somebody said, uh, you believe wives, how do you do with that passage that says, let a bishop be the husband of one wife. He said that means at least one. But, uh, he had it explained anyhow. Mm-hmm. Well, a heresy always hunts obscurity. And Paul's teaching off the digital text. You see, my brethren, it is like if I were to take you to my other farm. And I would say to you, now here you will find apples and beaches and grapes. And here are watermelons and cantaloupe and sweet potatoes and 15 or 20 edible fruits or vegetables or grains and say, now this is all yours. And I would come back a month later and find my guests half starved. And when I would say to them, what's the marriage? They would say, well, we are on the marriage. Because we have found a plant that we can't identify. There is a plant behind the old oak stump, back there in, in the near end of the far field, just over the hill. And we have spent it trying to identify this plant. But I would say, you're starving, you look sick, you, you, you'll get TB. What's the matter with you? And they would say, well, we, uh, we're worried about this one verse, this one plant. What a lot of God's children do. They starve themselves to death knee deep in clover because there's one little old plant back in the, in the rear end of the, uh, of the field that they can't identify. And heretics always 
starve me to death while they worry you to death about that one obscure passage of Scripture. So I'm going to root it in order that nobody will come and uh, worry you with us and say that they know what it means and that it proves that you're wrong. Now, what this verse doesn't teach, or these verses, does is do not teach. They do not believe you know universalism is the belief in the restitution of all fallen beings to a state of blessedness. Some of in the restoration of all human beings to blessedness, not only Christians, but all to the blessedness. Then there is another kind of more exhaustive universalism which teaches the restitution of all human beings but the devil and all the fallen angels. They're very generous and take in everything, every human and every creature that has fallen and sinned against God. Now this is a dream born of desire. Universalism, the teaching that every moral creature would finally be saved, is a desire. And it springs from humanitarian motives, no doubt. Humanitarian feelings within the brain does the desire the salvation of all. But it is not taught in the scriptures. The Bible specific that except we repent we shall all likewise perish. And it pictures us a hell where the angels are and where all that are not found in the book of life are finally consigned. So the teaching is definitely not universalism. And whatever this passage teaches, which I have read in your hearing, it does not teach universalism. And it does not teach a second chance. Now, the Russellites, I do not call them Jehovah's Witnesses because I do not want to toil them by identifying it with any false teacher. But the Russellites teach that there is a second chance. They say that everybody that dies will have a chance in the future world. And then if he turns and he will be annihilated, he will cease to be. When a sinner dies, he sleeps in the earth, body and soul, a state of deep unconsciousness. And then when the resurrection comes, he will be raised and given another chance. If he turns down that chance, then he will be annihilated and cease to be, and there will be no hell. Now that's what the Russellites teach. They will hold up in passages like this. But this error thrives on digital text. It cannot stand the full Bible. It cannot stand the teachings of Jesus. It cannot stand the book of Romans. It cannot stand the book of Hebrews. It cannot stand the book of Revelation. It cannot stand the four gospels. It cannot possibly stand up under all the light of the Bible. It is a nice blooming plant and blooms in the shadow. But as soon as we turn the whole Bible loose on it, it withers and dies. Now, meaning that there are lost souls, which the scriptures call called spirits in the prison, that are dead. And some of these in the passage are identified as being the earth's population at the time of no flood. Heard the message preached, and they denied or refused it, rejected it. And uh, the result was that they tear their evil deeds at the coming of the flood. And it teaches us that these all were place of the dead. Hades in the New Testament, Joel in the Old, the place of the dead. And the Christ's body, when he lay three days in Joseph's new tomb, but that his spirit was not in his body, but separated from his body, and in that spirit, he went and preached to the spirits that were in Hades, the prison. You remember the Apostles' Creed that we from his and we sort of quit. Uh, we all believe in the Apostles' Creed. It says this about our Lord, the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried, and the third again from the dead. Now that's the way we Protestants have it. But the old Apostles' Creed reads like this. 
that Jesus Christ and Mary suffered on the Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried, and descended into Hades. And the third day he rose again from the dead. Now that was only saying what Peter said here. Paul said, as we'll notice later, that when Jesus Christ's spirit was free from the crucified body, that's not like quiescent or cover over the tomb. Jesus Christ, the eternal Son in his spirit, too. And so the work he had to do was to go descend into him, not into the fires of hell for punishment, but descend to the place of the dead, and there preach to those that had died and whose spirits were confined there. And so he preached the soundness of Noah, and he told them why judgment had come, and he justified the ways of God to man, and expressed what had taken place, in order that they might know that they were being treated as intelligent. Always remember, brethren, that God treats every human being as an intelligent being. You miss Einstein, but you're morally intelligent, and God will never violate your intelligence. And he'll never that you to simply shut your eyes and gulp and swallow whatever you He means that you're an intelligent moral being, and therefore he will not violate your intelligence. Treat you like a moral. There's a certain healing evangelist goes up and down the country. And when anybody comes and says they're still, they've got a demon in them, and he wants to pray for the demon to go out, he tells everybody in the congregation, now don't you up, for if you do, the demon will go on you. End of intimidation. That kind of trickery. Why, the magician who does tricks for money on a stage wouldn't be so cheap. Christ is casting out devils and healing the sick. I don't dare look, lest the demon will jump on me. Where do you find that? Is that in the New Testament? Where is that any place within the confines of the Word of God? Nowhere. That cheap. And I have no hesitation to look in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I never did any I never did anything with people's eyes shut. I never had to do anything in a hive. Religious activity should be an open book. Everything from the treasures receipt book up and down the church of Christ should be open to the eyes of mankind. And there's never any place in the Bible where God treats me uh, as if I didn't have good sense. So that even the spirits that were in prison, even and are in the place of the dead, our Lord went to them in his spirit and preached to them and explained in order that justice might be done. You take an ordinary English or American court, something like this goes on. I've been heard. The jury goes out and deliberate. They come back in. They pronounce the defendant guilty. And the judge says, will the defendant please rise and face the court? The defendant rises. The judge says something to this effect. Mr. So-and-so, the evidence has been heard, and the jurors have decided from the evidence that you have been guilty of such and such a crime. Before you are sentenced, is there anything to say? In other words, we're about to sentence you, but we're not abrogating your intelligence. You, like a robot, you are an intelligent human being, and you're able to judge us, and if we are uh, wrong you, you will judge us. Therefore, we want to clear this whole matter up. Have you any... Usually they don't have. But if there was anything that this intelligent sinner could say, the judge would give it respectful consideration. For in theory, at least, American and English courts are not 
railroad a man into the electric chair and order prison. We're going to do it according to the rules of justice, with all the gears showing and all the processes open before the eyes of mankind. So God and all the wicked were swept away as by a flood and hurled to the place of the dead, and they will never see the blessedness of heaven or know God. But we're not simply going to sweep them out as if they were inert bits of filth. They're human, they're intelligent, they're moral creatures. They're capable of exercising their own rights. Therefore, the everlasting Son of God went before the Spirit in prison and preached to the man. Preached to them though they were living and because they were spirits, they were alive. They had sinned in the flesh. And they were to be judged for the days they lived in the flesh. Their whole heart said, Amen, to the judgment of God. Now, my brethren, if you don't believe Scripture, to show why Christ descended into the place of the dead, and into hell, as it says. To teach it to ten. Turn to that, if you will, for a moment. It says, Wherefore, he says, descended up on high, he led captivity captive, and gave gifts unto men. Now that is it, but that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth. He that descended the same also that ascended up far above all things that he might fill all heavens that he might fill all things. We hear that when Jesus Christ's body lay in the grave, his spirit went to lower captive in the place and preached we released to them, and when he arose, he took with him all the redeemed spirits of them that had been trapped in the place of the dead, Hades. You remember Jacob said, I will go down unto Sheol, down unto Sheol, mourning for my son. And when Samuel, the dead man, came back him up out of the earth, but after the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and after Christ had taken thee with him to heaven, to the place of paradise, Paul said, I was caught up into paradise to the third heaven. Was no one but up. The Lord himself, the Lord of life and glory, had taken his ransomed ones out of the place of the dead. But it contained not only the redeemed ones, but it contained also those that were not redeemed. Separated, however, a great gulf that was fixed. Lazarus and the rich man explained that. When the rich man died, he went to the place of And when Lazarus died, he went to the place of the dead. This time, Abraham's bosom, with a great gulf fixed to So when our Lord descended, descended after his death, he descended into Hades. He took all in Abraham's bosom up to heaven and left the rest there. But in doing it, he explained it and preached in his spirit to all that were in the place of the dead. Now, if that isn't enough, let me give you Philippians 2 and 11. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted Jesus, and given him of every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven and things in under the earth and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Not only those in heaven and those on earth, but those in hell are forced to confess with their tongue that Jesus Christ is Lord. This they do to the glory of God the Father. So you see, my brethren, that passage that Peter gives universalism, he teaches only that Jesus Christ our Lord while his body lay in the grave, went in his spirit to Sheol, the place of the dead, and there he preached deliverance to the ransom, and judgment to the lost, took his ransomed ones with him and left the lost for the dead. But everyone, those under the earth and those on the earth, and all creatures everywhere, 
admit that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This Jesus Christ, our Lord, is ruled over any who do not willingly submit to his rule. He will not enforce rule over one human being or one moral creature, but he will force from the unwilling of even lost ones the fact that he's right. True and righteous are thy judgment, O Lord, will be the only text in hell. The only text in hell, and I'm not sure it won't be cut against the spirit of that terrible place. True and righteous are thy judgment, O Lord. In order that that money to all the three worlds above and on the earth and beneath, there had to be a declaration of the plan of God those that are dead as well as those that live. But there is not one sentence, not, not one word, not one letter in the Bible that teaches that Jesus ever preached the dead and said, Come unto me. He said, Come unto me to the living. But he never preached the gospel of redemption and gave an invitation and said, Come. It is appointed unto men once to die and after that to judge it was done in order that the dead as well as the living, the lost as well as the sick, might know how true and just and righteous how God is, and how impeccable is, how holy are his ways, and that he doeth all things well. Admit that this is not the kind of a message to send you out with more time, but you need to hear this, we needed to know this, so the next time someone comes pushing your doorbell, you be I know what the Bible teaches, thank you, goodbye. Quietly close, never slam it, don't slam it, that's not nice. Christians never slam doors, but close it rather uh, quickly. I would suggest. Because the false teachers are growing and their numbers are growing, they're leaps and bounds. In Chicago, our 57th annual missionary council, we had about 1,100 of them. That summer, when I was teaching at Keswick, out in the east, we were helping getting to Lincoln Tunnel. You know why? The traffic was so heavy on the road. And you know why they're so heavy on the road? Jehovah's Witness is a stadium. One hundred thousand strong. After fifty-seven years of missionary, we get 1,100. They had one hundred thousand crazy. So you need to know that you don't bless you at the time. So you will have a shield of truth to raise our doubt of error. Father, bless thy word. Just help us to see how wondrous are thy judgments and thy ways past finding out. To receive with bowed heads and reverence the hard, obscure things as well as the easy, plain things. And we thank thee, Lord, that easy, plain things outnumber the others perhaps a thousand to one. Bless thou the word. Thank you. Thank you.